are we ready to start presentation stuff? We are ready. Okay, cool. So this is a talk I did at uh, Big Ruby Conference in Dallas uh, earlier this year, and uh, I was talking with James, and uh, I told him it's about celluloid and invented architectures and some things like that. And he says, "Oh, can you bring that here?" And I said, "Sure." And then I promptly forgot about it till he tweeted me last week, and he said, can, "Are you still coming?" And I thought it was last week. And I said, "No, I'm in Scotland. I can't come." And he says, "No, no, no. It's this week." And I thought, "Oh, good, good. What was I saying again?" And uh, so I, I, dug, I dug this thing out. I got all my demo code. I played with it today. It's all working. So I think we're going to have some fun with this. This is going about being. This talk is about Ruby. It's about code. It's about threads. It's about events, and it's about something else. But I want to have fun today, and this is the big purpose of my talk. And let me show you some fun things I've been doing recently. So here. I don't know if you can see this. This is, a, uh, this is a movie, and I'm starting off showing my terminal screen here. You can almost see the code here. It uh, creates a drone object, tells it to start, says drone take off, sleep for five seconds. That lets the drone get in the air. And then for two times, we go through this loop where we make the drone go left, then right, and then left and right again the second time through the loop. Then we tell the drone to hover and sleep for a second, then land, sleep for five seconds, then we shut the whole thing down. I'm going to hit uh, start this movie here. And I got to sleep for five down here in the command line. So when I hit that return about right now, I've got five seconds to run across the office. This is me running. See, I am post agile. <laughs> and there we go. Take off, hover, go left, go right, go left, go right, hover, and land. OK. So I am controlling the AR drone there uh, programmatically by sending commands over the Wi-Fi and making it do things. So I'm going to use that kind of as a framework for talking about code today. So that's one of the fun things that I'm working on right now. I, uh, last weekend, I was actually at a Nodecopter event in Scotland where uh, we had 10 drones and a room full of people, and we all paired up, and we wrote code to make our drones do different things. Some people made their drones dance. Uh, there's a camera on the drone there that someone grabbed the picture from the drone and did facial recognition. So if the drone was looking around and it locked on a face, it would stare at you. <laughs> okay? Until you moved out of its field of view, then it would start scanning for more faces again. So uh, just all kinds of cool things people are doing with these drones. It's really, really exciting. So our talk is Ruby Code Threads Events and Flying Robots. I prefer the term flying robots. It seems less threatening than drones. Okay, and especially if they're programmed in Ruby, I mean, they're friendly flying robots then, right? Okay, but before we get in code, I want to talk about something called narrative charts. And this is, comes from um, an XKCD uh, cartoon. And uh, I don't know, has anyone seen 12 Angry Men? Yeah, awesome movie. It is entirely about uh, a jury deliberating on a trial. You don't see the trial. All you see are 12 men in a room arguing for the entire length of the movie. And this is the narrative chart for that. 12 people in the same location the entire time. So very, very, very simple narrative chart for 12 Angry Men. Um, it's, it's a good movie. It's, it's, actually, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> 12 angry men. I got it. I think most of you are familiar with the Star Wars movie. I won't ask who's seen this one, because if you haven't, you'll be embarrassed in this group. Uh, this is the narrative chart for that. So Vader's up there. Here's his timeline, and then he joins up with Leia here. Uh, they go to the Death Star. Uh, Obi-Wan and Luke and R2 and d all get together. Here's Han and Chewie. And so it's, it's kind of charting where people are at various points in the movie. And I love this one. Jabba the Hutt here <laughs> is, is, is he's a straight line here, except for the special edition. He has them come and meet Han and Chewie there. So I, I love that, uh, that. And Greedo yes. dies right here. But the chart doesn't say who drew first. Uh, has anyone seen Primer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got it on Netflix. 
Um, it is, uh, there's basically three characters in this movie and it involves time travel. Okay, the, what happens if it actually works means what happens if you could really build a time machine and what would happen. Here's the narrative chart for Primer. <laughs> <laughs> You have to watch Primer multiple times before you can even figure out what's going on. It is really that crazy. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, I, like I said, I gave this talk at a uh, big Ruby conference, and I really wanted to do something with Ruby that was outside the web. Uh, most people here use Ruby for doing web work, Rails or something else, and I really wanted to touch on something that was non Rails related at the big Ruby conference and kind of give people an idea that Ruby is good for other things than just doing web programs. So, um, yeah, so here I want to tell a story about a particular project I worked on. I'm going to change the names of this project, uh, A, to, ha to, to make it more anonymous, and B, to, to introduce a much more fun problem domain than what we originally worked in. Uh, but um, I'm going to tell a story. It's going to be a non-web project. We're going to talk about code and threads and events in this story. And it's going to deal with flying robots, which I think makes any talk much, much better. And we're going to learn something about Ruby as we go along. So here is the uh, problem domain. Suppose uh, you're working for a uh, 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 company that controls robots of various types. And you have multiple like Roombas and robots out there on the floor, and they communicate back to your server, represented here. Uh, this is at like a TCP/IP link or some kind of link coming back to your servers, and then you're running managers on your server to talk to all these individual robots. So there's a Roomba manager that talks to the individual Roombas. There's a robot manager that talks to individual robots, and you want to add your your job is to add a new manager that will talk to flying drones. Uh, it's going to be very similar to the other, pro uh, to the other managers. Uh, the protocol will be a little bit different because drones have a little bit different way of speaking than Roombas and, and regular robots do. And uh, the original code was written in Java, but we decided to write our drone manager in Ruby because at the time I had been Java free for many years and I didn't want to spoil the streak. And we thought that Ruby could really do the job. Uh, originally, they felt that Java was the choice for this particular project. But we thought, no, we can make Ruby talk to these hardware devices and control these drones. Now, let me give you an order of magnitude here. Um, it's not just two drones that we're talking about. Uh, the hardware that we had to interface uh, in real life was actually in the thousands. We had to be able to talk to thousands of devices in real time from a single uh, manager program like that. Now, uh, this is just part of the whole picture. The, whole, the big picture means that these managers talk through some kind of messaging queue to a set of workers that dump into a database. So if a drone does something, it talks to the drone manager. The drone manager puts out a message queue. The message queue is then emptied by a worker who updates the database to indicate the current status of the drone. And then a Rails web portal can display the, uh, the status of that drone at any particular time by querying the database like you normally would with Rails. So there's Rails in the picture, but we're going to talk about this piece of it. I don't want to talk about the Rails back end at all. So what I'm going to introduce is a monitor program that will monitor the state of all the drones, and it will talk directly to the drone manager. And it's going to put up, uh, so we're going to look, we're going to concentrate on the code of the drone manager. Um, I'm not going to worry about the monitor or the drone code itself. Uh, let's concentrate on the manager portion of the code base. Uh, the drones will talk to the manager with the flying robot objects with navigation protocol. Uh, the frown protocol is very simple. It actually has just four commands. There are two commands that drones will send. They will send a position command with an X and a Y coordinate. And they will send a name command that declares what the name of this particular drone is. And drone names are single character names. The drones receive, let's say they can receive a couple frown commands as well. Name question mark means the... <laughs> Sorry, I just got that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Doug just remembered the actual name of the protocol. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> uh, drones receive a name question mark command, and when they receive that, they are to immediately put out a name command back to the manager. So uh, the manager will say, oh, what's your name? And the drone will say, oh, my name is blah. So that's, that's what it should respond to with. Um, also, a drone can receive a cra crash bang command. And that means you have run into another drone, you have crashed, immediately disconnect from the manager. You are out of the picture. You have lost the game. So a crash command and name commands are the two things that your drones uh, respond to. That's the frown protocol. Uh, here's an example uh, communication. So a drone will send its position when he starts up. The monitor gets it and he says, oh, new drone, uh, what's your name? And the drone will say, oh, my name is A, and he'll send that back. And then he'll send position updates back, back, back. Eventually, he might crash. The monitor will inform the drone that he has crashed. At that point, the drone should disconnect from the manager and, and go off the network. OK, questions? How does the manager know that the drone has crashed? Uh, he keeps track of the position of all the other drones. And if, you, if they occupy the same space, point in space, then the, the manager reports. Actually, it's the monitor at the far end that reports them having crashed. So the monitor is keeping track of the position of everybody. So, so in, this is not quite real life. This is more of a virtual drone situation here. OK, but for fun, for fun. OK, so this is what it'll look like. We'll have a bunch of drones running here. We'll have a drone manager that actually talks over TCP IP to all these individual drones. And then the drone manager will connect up to a, a drone monitor program also over TCP IP. And the drone monitor program will uh, do up a simple ASCII display and show the position of all the drones at any given point in time. And as the drones move around, he will update this display and move the drones uh, around. And notice, and notice that uh, it's the name of the drone with two colons on the side. Those are the blades spinning. OK. All right. Drone, the drone manager is just a conduit. He does nothing. He, if he, uh, in fact, let's, let's talk about this. So the drone sends in a frown command to the manager. The manager will package that up, and he will put a, a hash together containing the name of the drone, the drone ID, uh, and the command. OK, this drone just connected. This drone just disconnected. Or this drone just sent frown data, and here's the frown data right here. So there's three kinds of commands that the drone manager sends over to the monitor. So the monitor knows the state. So whenever a drone originates a command, it goes through the manager and over here. So the manager is just purely a conduit for connecting up to multiple drones, managing their connection, but then ultimately putting together packets to send to the monitor. So the monitor talks over one connection. The drone manager talks over multiple connections. Uh, from the monitor, you have also packets that look like this. Uh, the ID of the drone that he wants to send to, the fact that it is a frown command he's setting, and then the actual frown command itself as part of the data of the packet. And these, are, these hashes are serialized as JSON and just sent over a TCP IP socket. So it kept very simple, very simple. OK. Questions so far? Yeah. Commands, messages, uh, yeah, they are, that's pieces, hunks of information flying back and forth, ultimately communicating the drone with the monitor, with the manager in the middle managing, just managing all the TCP IP connections. Okay, so let's look at the code. <coughs> so, we decided to use Event Machine on our project. How many people here have used Event Machine in Ruby? OK, nice, nice. Event Machine is a really nice evented architecture for Ruby code. It's a lot like Node.js. In fact, it's almost exactly, uh, fills the same function as the asynchronous nature of Node.js. It implements all your I.O. through events that get signaled to your objects, and you respond to events through callbacks. And that's how Event Manager works. So for example, to start up our program, we have to say event machine run, and it's given a block here, and it runs all this code in here inside the event machine event loop. We uh, create two sessions, a monitor session and a drone session, and these sessions listen on TCP IP ports. So they are servers. 
So this guy, the um, drone session is going to listen to that particular socket, 8090. The monitor session is going to listen to 8091, plus one over here on the socket port. And when something connects to them, they will start pushing data back and forth through all those connections. You will have multiple sessions for drones. You should have only one session for a monitor. Okay. And I highlighted these things in red so I could talk about it. And I keep forgetting that. So there you go. There's the three things that we're talking about. So that starts it up. Let's look at the drone. Oh, well, let's here. Let's. This is this is the callbacks that you will get. The important callbacks you will get over the lifetime of, of a session. When. Oh, so, so notice here. This is a. That's not an object. That's a class or a module. So when a connection comes in, when somebody connects up to that TCP IP port, a vent machine will say, oh, here is a drone session class or module. I'm going to instantiate an object based upon that class or module. And then I'm going to, oh, so he creates it. So we actually create a drone session here. And then after you're created, I'm going to send it the post init message. So you're going to get created. You're going to get a message, an event called post init. Whenever data comes in, whenever you get a line of data from the TCP socket that you're serving, I'm going to call receive line. And then you have to respond to that. Whenever the connection is closed, event machine will send your session the unbind event. And you can also explicitly close or this is a method I added because I wanted to record the reason, you know, why something's closed. And this is just generally initiated by software. Uh, it crashed. So send the close because drone qua crashed as a reason. And then, then it will close the session because of that. So these, these are the events. And these are the major ones. Uh, post init, receive line, and unbind are the three major ones we have to respond to in our TCP uh, to handle the TCP IP data. Here is the drone session. Yeah, I did it as a module. You can do it a module or a class. Uh, you have to include the EM protocols line text 2 module, and that means that it's going to feed you lines of data from the socket rather than packets of data from the socket. So it just kind of depends. That kind of defines how event machine feeds you data. And I don't know what happened to protocol line text number one. Evidently, they decided two was better. Here's our post init. This is what gets called when the connection is made. And so you will get this before you start receiving data. I just take advantage of that to log the IP addresses that we're connected to so we can see what's connecting up. And then I store this session object in a global hash called connections. I use a connection ID that is unique for this session. I will, um, whenever you call connection ID, it generates it and it's a lazy initialization. So the first time you call it, it'll create a new connection ID and then it remembers that for that session for thereafter. I store myself in that connection object there, in that connection hash, for later reference. Okay. Uh, when I receive a line of data, uh, the first thing I want to do is send a connect message to the monitor. So in Q is a little me a method I wrote that uh, writes to the monitor. And I'm sending it a connect message. It says, okay, uh, okay, this is, I've just connected. I've not sent any data yet before. So, uh, and that tells the monitors to set up data structures so it can start handling, so it knows about this particular drone. Uh, that drone ID will go along with that. So that uh, connection ID that we set up here goes along in the enqueue message that gets sent along with it so that the uh, monitor can identify messages uh, from it. Uh, then mark that we have received a message. I then decode the message. Uh, it just like strips white space off of it and cleans up the line a little bit. And then I send the decoded message data to the monitor uh, using that hash syntax that we talked about earlier. So that's how I handle data coming in. Uh, when I close it, I want to see if I have ever received a message. I want to send a disconnect. I don't have to send disconnect if I never received a message in the first place. So that's why I'm checking there. And then I delete myself from the global connections hash. So I don't know about that 
session anymore. So that's unbind, that happens when we close the TCP IP socket. And that's essentially a vent machine for handling data going across essentially front, so this is the drone session, so this is data from the, receiving data from the drone, formatting it and sending it on to the monitor, and that's the purpose of this. Let's look at some of the helper methods here. Here's the enqueue method I mentioned earlier. This sends data to the monitor. And I just build up the hash here, uh, put in the connection ID, I put in the fact it's a frown command, pass on the data here, convert it to JSON, and then I send it to the monitor. And there's the this message of server here is the monitor session that is monitoring, that is talking to the monitor. So I've got two, two session, well, I've got one monitor session talking to the one monitor object. I've got multiple drone sessions, each drone session talking to an individual drone. So data comes in from a drone, gets tagged with an ID, and then gets sent to the single monitor instance. Okay. Let's see this run. Okay, so I've got multiple windows here. I'm going to run the programs in these various windows. And we're going to, let's see, ruby-ilib uh, bin monitor, no, this is, this will be the manager program. And I'm going to use the event, the evented version of him. We'll go ahead and start him up. So, he's running. He's the drone manager program. I set TCP IP sockets. Oh, that was me clicking the laser. I thought, why is my program putting out garbage? That, that'd be worried, but it's the laser inserting characters. It's, it's a keyboard thing. I'm going to put that down so I don't do that. Over here in this window, here, I'm going to start ruby i lib. Uh, bin slash monitor and use the evented version of the monitor and he's going to start up there and then down here let's start a single drone program now these are all talking together oh, they're running on the same computer but they're actually using TCP IP to communicate between all these separate processes so you could in theory move this off to another box and we might do that later tonight so, uh, ruby-ilib, bin, uh, drone, evented, and I have to give it a name, and this will be drone A. Ah, look! There's my drone A, and you can see he's flying around the field. It's a, it's a 15 by 15 square that he's flying around in there, and you can see him moving around. Let's start up another drone program. Uh, ruby-ilib, bin drone evented and this will be drone B and there's B flying around you notice when he came up he was a question mark at first that's because the first thing the drone does is send his position the monitor gets and says I've got a new connection coming across I don't know who you are he sends a name command back to the drone the drone says oh I'm drone B he sends a command back through the manager to the monitor and the monitor then displays the B. Now they're flying around. If you let this fly long, they're just, they're just randomly moving one square at a time once a second. Eventually they're going to hit if we let that run long enough. <laughs> I know, the tension, the drama. <laughs> Actually, let's, 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 do, let's do this. More drones. Fortunately, I have a uh, program called Fly that uh, you give it the number of drones you want to set up, and it will actually start uh, subprocesses running the drone command. So it'll start up. This will start up ten drones all at once. It does a system command, yeah, essentially forks. Boom, boom. Yeah, you can see. Uh, a crashed, I crashed, E and B crashed into each other. There can be only one. Oh, B crashed over here. Yep, yep, yep. So when it crashed, it died. 
Let's start him up. I'm going to start him up with a dash command here so we can see him. Oh, Jay is the only one left. And there's our dash running in the... So yeah, so that's, that's the drawing. It's, it's actually working. TCP IP command's going back and forth. The evented model is running. It is managing. Oh, crashed. OK, cool. That drone manager program can handle thousands of connections in Ruby with very, very, very little overhead. And it wasn't too hard to write. Uh, yeah, you can see here, if you look up here, uh, the, ta the uh, file descriptor table size by default is 256. But we know the system commands do to change that to something bigger. So we changed to 5,000. So I could handle, in theory, up to 5,000 connections. In the real program that we were running, we have tested it up to you know, a nice fraction of 1,000 connections. And it, it is performant, and it works. And it is not the bottleneck in the system at all. So Ruby doing stuff that originally people thought you needed Java to do. And I think that's pretty cool. Why do you feel like you need a, the, the manager and the monitor? The monitor is standing in for the entire Rails front end stuff. If you remember, the manager originally put it into a message queue that got loaded up into a database that was eventually read by a Rails front end. The monitor is standing in for that whole big front piece of architecture there. And the nice thing is that I can take the monitor, let's see, let's, let's start up one drone here. I can fly it. Now he's flying there. I can kill the monitor, and I can also bring him back up, and he's still flying. So uh, the manager is, so I, uh, you know, that monitor is standing in for the big front end system. I can do upgrades to that, drop it down, bring it back up, and as long as the manager is still running there, I don't drop any of my TCP connections to all the drones, and uh, those connections still are happening. And that's actually a big deal, because if you think about that, if you have a thousand hardware devices sitting out there spread all across the world and you bring up your server and he says and it announces hey I'm ready to go you will have a thousand devices all trying to connect at once we call that problem the thundering herd and that's actually pretty big overhead so you don't want to drop those TCP IP connections if you don't have to so by having the manager program there that is small. There are very rare, ch because it's a small program, there's rarely any software changes to it. And we can do a system upgrade without dropping all those connections. So that's, that's part of the architecture design there. All right. I'm going to run that one. And I'm going to run, let's just run one over here. And those guys will fly around. I'm going to go back to the slides, and we'll come back to see if they ever crash or not. OK, so what do we like and what do we not like about this particular solution? Well, there's a number of things we like. It handles a bazillion connections and does so fairly easily with low overhead. That is a nice feature of a vented I.O. Uh, and, and very, very low overhead in doing that. So we really, really, really like that uh, feature of, of this of a vent machine for doing that. It is single threaded. That means I don't have to worry about locks or mutexes or shared mutable state or anything like that, I can just write Ruby code and not worry about having to lock stuff. So it's single threaded. That's nice. Single threaded is also a downside, though. Because it is single threaded, that means I can only use one CPU at a time. And that is also a general problem with evented architectures. They tend to use only a single CPU. And so they don't take advantage of the fact that I've got a hyper-threaded multi-CPU laptop sitting here, let alone the server that we're running on. But you're, if you're running the manager, though, you said it's pretty small. Well, why would you need multiple um, if, if you wanted to use a vented I.O. to do more logic, uh, having it, being able to spread it across multiple CPUs might be an advantageous thing to do. This particular application, not so much. It wasn't a big problem with us. But it would be nice to be able to do that in general. That's one of the downsides of a vented I.O. You could run multiple instances and yes. put a in front of it. Yes. Of yes. Yes. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay. So, yeah, just hold on to that thought. 
Um, also, the downside, it has a vented logic. And I don't know if you have ever extensively programmed in an vented environment. But simple things like this, this was not bad. This was actually a very, very, very simple invented, evented uh, uh, program. Just a couple of events we had to handle, the things we had to do in each event was very straightforward. I didn't show you the monitor side of the house, but it's very, very similar, just doing things in reverse, taking stuff from the monitor and shoving it out to the appropriate drone. Um, so this, this was very simple, but evented logic, when you start getting into complex systems, evented logic begins to get a little bit mm -hmm, crazy. Okay, For example, here is, uh, is the way I close down my session. I say, I, OK, I'm, I'm asking the session to close because of a particular reason. I log the reason. I then say, event machine timer new 5, and that sets up a 5 second delay. And 5 seconds is going to call the block, and it's actually going to close the connection in 5 seconds. That allows the session to quiesce, to get rid of any pending data and get it out so I don't like, you know, there might be a command sitting in the queue. And this allows that command to get out to the drone before I close the connection and actually lose that data. So I give it a little the connection time to quiesce is the term. Um, and th this, this is not too bad, but this tends to be what happens with evented logic. If I wanted to do something asynchronous, I give it a block. It gets a result. It passes the result to the block. Then in the result, I want to do something else. I have to give it a do end. And the events just keep nesting deeper and deeper and deeper. And the more complex logic you get, the more troublesome this becomes. And it's difficult to unwind this logic easily. This is a, actually a well-known problem with evented logic, and you'll see blog posts like this on how to avoid the callback spaghetti. And there's techniques for avoiding it, but I mean you have to be aware of it, and it is, it, it is troublesome. Okay. How'd that get in here? Callback spaghetti, callback spaghetti yes, okay. <laughs> Now, let's get back to that threaded question, which is really interesting. So, so why am I avoiding threading? Well, threading means that if I have two threads running, everybody, I, I, I'm assuming most people are familiar with the problem of writing threaded code. If I have shared mutable state, shared by two different threads that both change that data, I have a conflict that's going to happen. It's a race condition waiting to happen. That means I have to control access to that. There's a couple ways of solving this problem. Number one, don't thread. That's, that's a vintage uh, way of doing it. Don't thread, just put everything in a single thread, then you don't have to worry about locking. Of course, that means you only use a single CPU. OK. Go ahead and do threading, but set up a mutex that provides exclusive access for one thread or another while he's, doing while he's accessing or changing the mutable state. Now, this is. is all threading libraries allow you to do things like this. The downside to this is that it requires cooperation. If one of the threads forgets to acquire the mutex before changing the state, you've got a race condition, and you're right back to where you started. So you have to cooperate. This kind of solution does not compose well. I cannot hide the fact I'm grabbing a mutex inside a method because that might interfere with deadlocks, or, or it's difficult to compose locks. Uh, using abstractions. Um, and I can give you examples of how the, those kinds of problems occur, but I don't want to get into that right now. It just doesn't compose. And there's a possibility of deadlocks. If, uh, if uh, thread number one here grabs a mutex and then tries to grab a second mutex on a different object, and, but thread number two has already grabbed the second mutex, and now he's trying to grab the first mutex, they're both waiting for the other guy to give up before any of them proceed, and that's a deadlock. Neither one of them can proceed and do useful work because they're waiting for the other to complete first. And if you're not very, very, very careful on how you manage your, um, your mutexes, you will quite possibly get into deadlock situations, and they are a bear to figure out because they don't, it's, it's a distributed problem. It's a problem that's spread out over your entire system. It's not a problem in this module. It's a problem with how all the modules cooperate. So it means you have to start setting policies on how mutexes are acquired, such as you always require these mutexes in this order. Or you have to have fallback schemes. If 
I, we time out, then I release all my mutexes, and I try again. And so, so there's, there's things you have to do to handle the, the deadlock situation. So threading, an ugly situation. So don't share, and this is what you suggested. Uh, run multiple processes, put a proxy in front, let multiple uh, drone managers uh, set up and, and do that. Um, and we have done that as well. Um, we ha actually have two servers in the, in the real hardware world. We have two servers running on separate machines, actually. Fault uh, tolerance. Uh, yeah, well, for fault tolerance, and so they share the load as well. That makes it really interesting because messages coming back have to know which this manager is talking to that drone and this manager is talking to that drone. So this message has to figure out which manager to talk to to get it to the right drone. Or maybe you send the message to both and the, and the manager sort out. I mean, there's, there's issues with that as well. If these processes need to communicate, though, then you're back to how do we get them to communicate. Sockets, uh, inter process communication, uh, shared memory. Oops, there we go back to the mutex issue again. And so, so inter process is, is another issue. The downside of this is heavy weight using multiple processes, which are much heavier than an individual thread. They are me very memory inefficient because you're duplicating the memory for both of these processes. Um, since we had them on separate machines, it wasn't a big deal for us. But if you wanted to take advantage of multiple CPUs on one machine, then Ruby code tends to use up its own memory. And over time, they might even start sharing memory uh, with copy and write enabled. But over time, they will diverge and they will have their own their own memory sets. So it could be heavy, uh, heavy on memory usage, and communication between processes can be difficult. So another solution, and this is Clojure's solution. Let's not mutate. If I don't ever change the data, there's no problem, because there's only shared mutable data that's a problem. So let's not mutate our shared data. And this actually works very well in Clojure, which is a functional language and doesn't mutate its data much anyways. And Clojure says, OK, sometimes we do need to mutate. And if we do, I'm going to give you software transactional state memory that is atomic. So changes to it are atomic, and you won't get race conditions when you change that. So you reserve the STM memory for the rare cases you need to mutate shared state, and everything else, the major cases, immutable state that you share. And that actually works fairly good for Clojure. But Clojure is designed to be immutable. Um, so don't share or mutate. This is the Erlang solution. <laughs> uh, this is the actor model where processes communicate via message queues, actually mailboxes. So if I want this thread to talk to that thread, they don't share data in memory. They construct a message, and you put the message in the mailbox for that thread. And that thread eventually is going to get around and look at that message and respond appropriately to it, maybe sending messages back on the queue for this particular thread. That's actually a very good way to work. And that's the Erlang way of doing it. Clojure also has actors. If you want to do uh, this style in Clojure, uh, Scala has actors as well. So a lot of languages give you this, this uh, technique. And the nice thing about that is that within this thread, I can mutate all I want to. But there's no shared state in that thread. So um, as long as I keep communication cross threads to the message queues, this actually works fairly well for languages that don't have immutable state like closure. So uh, not, a, not a bad solution. So what works well with Ruby and the actor model that Erlang has actually is a nice solution. And there's a library for that. There's an app for that. There's a library for that called Celluloid. Celluloid is an object-oriented actor solution. It takes objects. Well, let's, let's take a look at it here. Here is a class. This is right out of the documentation for celluloid. It takes a class called Sheen. It includes celluloid. And that magically transforms this regular Ruby object into an actor object that has special properties. First of all, it is backed by a thread. When I create a new Sheen object, there is a thread running in that object. And whenever I call a message on that object, whenever I call a method on it, that method forms up an, a message to an internal mailbox on the thread. The thread pulls the, the data off the mailbox, performs whatever needs, uh, calls the proper method internally that we define here, and then sends the data back to the originating thread synchronously. But it happens in a different thread. So when I call set status, the sheen object 
creates a message containing the status data, sends it in the mailbox to the thread, the thread pulls it off, it runs this code, this actual method then, and then takes the result of this method and returns it back to the originating object as a result. So when I say set status, bam, you get it, and the result comes right back. And this is a synchronous call. I cannot tell the difference between that call and a regular Ruby method call. It looks the same. I call it, I get data back, and it's synchronous. If that thread is busy, set status will sit and wait for the thread to eventually answer its mailbox, set the status, and return the value of set status back to us. Now there's other ways I can call set status. I can say Charlie async set status, and this sends off a message to the mailbox. The object gets the mailbox and does the set status and then does nothing. It does not return data. So the person calling this version of set status returns immediately. Kind of nice. That means I don't have to wait. If that thread is off and busy and doing something, I say, do this please, and I go off and I continue working. So I know eventually that object's going to get around and doing that, but it doesn't happen right away for me. Uh, and here, report, if you look back here, report uh, returns a string containing the status, so you can see what the original one is. So you have asynchronous sets, you have uh, synchronous calls, and you choose, the caller chooses how he wishes to interact with your celluloid object. Internally, everything is done through a mailbox. Externally, you can call it and pretend you don't care that it's a mailbox, or call it and say, take advantage of the fact it's a mailbox. Yeah. So when you include celluloid, it sets up all the things for every method? Yes. Yes. That happens automatically just by including celluloid into your class object. OK. So suppose I wanted to write a drone controller uh, for my manager. I don't have to worry about callbacks. I write it as if I was just writing straight Ruby code. Look at this. Uh, here's I. Um, now forget the I/O thing. I'll get to the I/O thing in a minute. Just pretend I did celluloid I/O, just regular celluloid. Um, I call run. I define a run method. I call it from my main. I, I'll say drone controller dot new. Create the object. Then I will say dot async run. And all of a sudden, this method will start running inside the thread. And my main program goes off and does whatever he wants to. This is now running in a thread. And he goes and he creates a uh, socket. That's actually done in the initialization. I'm not showing it here. And I get, while we're running, and I get a line from the socket, I look at the line. Is it the name command? Is it the crash command? Bam, just keep doing that. So this is, this is uh, just using celluloid. When I'm done, when I'm signaled that I have crashed, I set my running state to false. That kicks me out of the loop. I come down here and close my, my socket, and I end, and I fall off. I am done. There's no callbacks. There's no weird callback logic I have to worry about. I write it straight as is. It runs in a thread, and I don't have to worry about anything. OK. Problem is, I've got to deal with thousands of drones, potentially thousands of drones. Creating a thread for thousands of drones each is kind of a heavyweight thing. I mean, threads are much, much, much lighter than a process. But even so, a thousand threads starts to get a little heavy-handed there, because every thread needs its own stack and blah, blah, blah. So it's a little bit heavyweight. So when you get up to that magnitude size, you'd like something a little even lighter weight than what a thread is. And that's where celluloid I.O. comes in. Celluloid I.O. is designed to work with celluloid. It does much the same thing as a regular celluloid does, but it turns your object into a celluloid object that does I.O. through evented behavior behind the scenes that you never see. 
So it's doing the invented stuff in the background. It's using fibers and threads as needed to implement that. But everything I just told you about celluloid is still true with a celluloid I.O. object, except that, uh, that you're not uh, burning a thread on every celluloid I.O. object. You're just doing very, there's a thread pool that executes through these things. It uses fibers to switch back and forth between them. It's very lightweight. And, and it's actually a very good solution. It is as lightweight as the original, almost as lightweight as the original invented uh, event machine version would be. Uh, yeah. It provides socket classes that uh, do non-blocking I.O. that are duct typed to the original Ruby socket classes. So when I create a socket in a celluloid I.O. object, I'm really creating a non-blocking socket. But it has the same API as a regular socket, so I don't care. And behind the scenes, the whole evented mess is handled for me. And I'm dealing with pure objects and messages like I want to be. So here's our drone cell again. I include cellulite I.O. Uh, I create a server object here. And then I say async run. Remember async? So I'm in the object itself. I call async. And my new method then starts the uh, asyncness running right there, the run method. Here is, OK, so uh, let's see. So, so create the server. I create a hash of drones. Since I'm now dealing with objects, I decided I can keep my hash inside my drone here. And I don't need to make it global. It works out actually a little bit nicer. I tell my, my uh, object to run asynchronously. Here's the run loop. Uh, since this is a server object, uh, when I call server accept, that gives me a regular, that returns a regular TCP IP socket. This is a standard way of, of doing TCP IP, right, for a server. You accept it. I tell it to handle the connection, but do it asynchronously. And then here's the handle connection. And again, it's a loop. Get a line, handle it. Get a line, handle it. Get a line, handle it. And it's all synchronous programming. I don't have any. Go back, go back a slide. Server accept blocks until you have a connection. Is that what I'm remembering? Yes. Server accept will sit there and wait for a connection request. If you remember server sockets in TCP IP, you say, I'm going to serve this particular port and, uh, on, on this machine. When a connection comes into port 8090, for example, here, it says, oh, I've got a connection. I'm going to create now a, I'm going to pass that, I'm going to create a new socket on a, another port. I'm going to give you this regular socket object that you're going to actually do I.O. on. And I'm going to go back and look for more connections on the server object. Yeah. So the server socket spawns other sockets for every connection attempt. That's how, that's how web servers work, right? Everybody connects up to port 80, but you can spawn multiple threads to handle those requests. And this is exactly how you do it. And this is, and this is standard TCP IP in Ruby. If I were to forget celluloid and just write this as regular TCP IP handling, this is exactly the same code I would write minus the async part here that I'm taking advantage of. Uh, so handling a uh, socket. Oh, we can get rid of this line protocol thing. When I first did this, uh, the socket didn't have gets and puts on it. It didn't have line-oriented methods on it, but they fixed that. So I don't need that line protocol thing anymore. Um, let's see, we generate uh, a UUID. I tell the monitor that I've connected to that with that drone ID. That alerts the monitor object. So, so I've got drone objects, I've got monitor objects that are communicating back and forth, just like regular object-oriented design stuff, right? It's just objects talking. And then I get into a loop. Oops. So, so with that one, you're connecting asynchronously and then you're looping. You know I'm, telling, I'm telling the monitor oh. to uh, informing him that a drone has connected. So, so remember, this is all inside the manager. And there's two halves of the manager. There's half of the manager that talks to the drone. There's the half of the manager that talks to the monitor. So when I, when I say monitor here, that's the half of the manager that talks to the monitor. My question is, is it possible and do you care could, could it be possible for you to do the monitor async send to server before that connect is done, and do you care? 
Uh, I do. The I, they, they're handled in order. Yes. Yes. So all this means is go and send the mailbox and then return immediately. Yeah. I don't wait for the month. So the, if the monitors, the monitors are probably out there busy handling requests coming in from the actual monitor program. So he will eventually get around to handling my connect message. And he will do that before he gets this message here from the drone itself. Yep. Yeah. So this async here means that this code doesn't wait. OK. And yeah, this same, same slide, I just simplified the code because I got rid of the message frame, which I thought was confusing. And I forgot to update the slide. In, in your slide here, you don't have line numbers, but you're setting your drone ID after you use it as a key on your drone's hash. Ah, uh, that's probably a bug. Right. And probably a bug in transcribing it to the slide. Right. But yeah, good call. And the async there. OK, so what we like, no callbacks. It's just straight Ruby code. Don't have to worry about the callback mess that we normally get into. I can use standard uh, TCP IP sockets, or actually duct type uh, to the standard ones. So there's nothing to learn there. It's efficient under the hood because it is using the same evented logic that event machine uses, except it's doing it under the hood for me. And it's using all the cores. It's a threaded machine. It's using all the cores to do this. Now, on MRI, you still have the global interpreter lock. If you're doing this under JRuby, you wouldn't have that problem. If you're doing it under Rubinius, you wouldn't have that problem. So there's still, you know, we haven't solved anything with the global interpreter lock issues. But, you know, we're, we're still making, taking advantage of the cores now. Yeah, yeah. And, and it should, these things are I.O. bound anyway. So the, the GIL is not such a big deal. Okay, uh, let's, let's do that demo again. And uh, yep, yep, they crashed. Surprise. Okay, so I'm going to start up the celluloid version of the manager. Okay, I actually have, I, instead of running the monitor, I actually have a, I actually wrote a celluloid version of the monitor. And on the fly program, I think if I say dash C, it'll use the celluloid version of the drone programs as well. So there we go. And oh, I told it to only do one. Panicking. Let's do 30. <laughs> mayhem, mayhem. So yeah, it all works just as well. You can see it's, uh, we're getting a little logging output here from celluloid. You can take care of that if you want to. Can we look at your CPU cores? Do you have a uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, activity monitor. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's not hitting them very hard at all, but uh, they all are all being hit more or less. One is being a little more than the other. Yeah, down here, down here. Way down there. Okay. Cool. Down to four drones. They're fighting it out. If you start with an odd number, chances are you'll have one left at the end, and you can declare him the winner if you want to. There, I, I added a new drone into the mix. He's the dash. Ah, two crash there, so we're down to three now. And notice the, the dash is running the evented drone logic. These guys here are running the celluloid. It doesn't care. I mean, they're in separate processes. They're talking the same protocol. You can mix and match these things as you want. It's all internal implementation details. But I, I found the celluloid version is actually very easy, easy to write. And, you, and in fact, you don't deal with callbacks. I really really like that. Okay. Jim, what's the relationship between celluloid and celluloid I.O.? Are they written by the same? Yes, guy? written by the same guy. They are designed to work together. Celluloid I.O. Um, looks much like a regular celluloid object, except that it uses, it's, uses the evented I.O. for its uh, sockets and things. 
Um, and it's designed to take advantage of evented I.O. on the back end, but still have the nice actor model for composing your programs up front. See, and now you've got objects. I mean, we're back to the object-oriented world again, where you create these objects and they're communicating with each other. And they can do it, so now they can do it just synchronously or asynchronously. And it's a really nice model for working. Uh, yes, because you might actually want to have a thread. Uh, okay. So, yes, a celluloid object has a thread backing it. A celluloid I.O. object does not have a thread, but I think it works off a pool of threads that service the evented I.O. So, yeah, that's a good question. There's actually other forms of celluloid as well that use other back ends for that, and I don't really understand it all. I know I've played with Zero MQ, and Zero MQ does some of the thread pooling or uh, event machine style sharing, um, and Celluloid does that as well, and I don't really understand it. There are a couple other different modules besides Celluloid I.O. There's, there's also things like uh, D-Cell and... Uh, Mm, distributed cells, yes, yes, D cell, uh, kind of more like the Erlang distributed model there. And there's also, and I forget the name of the project, but there's also a web server based on celluloid. Called Real. Real, yes. Celluloid, Real, I like that. R E E L, nice. Uh, we, we, love, we love our clever names in Ruby. There's a web machine implementation, which is similar to what Erlang has mm -hmm. inside of it for its HTTP stuff written in on top of real. Does anybody here use Rescue in their project? Uh, there is a celluloid version of Rescue called Sidekick and uh, we have switched to using that in our project and that means uh, we're running with threads for our workers rather than running individual processes and that has really brought down our our memory hit for that and it's a, just a wee bit faster too. I don't, I don't remember the details. It's worth mentioning that Tony, the, arth, the author of Celluloid, he, uh, he was a big Erlang guy and was trying to do a dynamic language on top of it called <laughs> Rhea. Yes. And, uh, and he basically gave up on that and went down the path of Celluloid. I really like this because this brings, this brings the actor model to Ruby and gives us a good library to start doing this. And Celluloid's fairly mature right now. Uh, I would not hesitate to use it in a, in a real project. Carefully, you know, test out, make sure it works, but um, those caveats, yeah, I would not hesitate to use it in production. And, and, and like I said, we're using the Sidekick uh, Rescue uh, version of it in real production right now. So uh, when, I, uh, when I pull up my phone and I tell it to turn on my desk lamp, uh, it's going through Sidekick workers to actually communicate. Well, I said what project it was. Oops. It's a distributed desk lamp program. Yes, a distributed, <laughs> a distributed desk lamp program. Um, actually, it's easier to unit test this stuff. I have found that a vent machine <sighs> pervades your program. It, it spits all over your code in places you don't expect. And it's really, really hard to write code that runs under a vent machine that can run without a vent machine. So it makes it really, really hard to unit test. I find that by using real objects that I can create and destroy and mock and do everything else with makes unit test a lot easier. When you unit test, do you, is there a way to like say, okay, well, just make all the calls synchronous, things like that? Yeah, like how do you when we're doing the way we just like things. turn off asynchronousness in the test? You just call them without the async. Yeah, just call it without the async. Um, if you're testing something that does something async. Yeah. That's more of a... Like, um, I'm, not sure it I'm not sure it matters, does it? Trying to test the overall happens. system to make sure. Yeah, if you're testing in, in an integration test environment, making sure what you expected to happen happened. Yeah, I think it does. There, I'm turning my lamp on on my desk at home. 
my daughter saying, Dad's playing with the system again. <laughs> and this, this went over the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing to the remote thing. The command comes back and goes through the rescue uh, queues, the, the sidekick queues, and updates the database. Then we see the result here. So, yeah, that's a real system that does it. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I have flown the drone downstairs in the basement over her head and did not get a pleased look from her. Uh, you always have the concept of get your own place. <laughs> I'm flying my drone through here. Yes. <laughs> Does celluloid have the idea of futures or anything like yes. that? Yes. Oh, good course, question. Yes. You can say, uh, like you can say, object dot um, async dot method. You can say object dot futures dot method, and it gives you a futures object back. So it sends it off to the mailbox. What you get back is a futures object that you hold on to, and when you're ready to use the result of that at some point in time later, you call dot value on that object, and you get the original result of the callback. And if, if it hasn't happened yet, you will block until it comes back. But if it's computed in the background, you get it immediately. So that's a really nice way of kind of halfway between async and not async. Well, it sort of maps between the fire and forget. I don't care about the result. And, yeah. Uh, I want to do this on a separate process, but I do care about the results. So yes. Well. Yeah, yeah. I love love futures. Uh, Rake has futures inside of it now. So when you do when you fire off a Rake job with a with multitasks in it, uh, the result of running those tasks send futures back that we collect and wait upon. So not celluloid futures, but we we got our own implementation. But yeah, futures are awesome. sender of the message. Like a callback? Yes, uh, yes. Now, in Erlang, what you end up doing is having a big case statement, right? Often, yes. Yes. That says, okay, if it's this message, do this. If it's this message, do this. This is like that, except instead of the big case statement, you just execute the method that you wanted called. So, right. I guess what I was asking so, is... So, so, so you don't get that reference back. Oh. It happens all internally. Because okay. oftentimes, the, the, with the actor model, the idea is to compose a bunch of actors together doing mm -hmm. random asynchronous stuff, you know, all over mm -hmm. the place. Mm -hmm. And so having access to the sender of the message... A lot if of you want to, put self to into the calling sequence. Just like you would with a regular object. If you want, if you, if you have an object and I want your object to call me back, uh -huh. I would pass self to you and you would call me back. So you could, you could totally do the same. Yeah, you totally do the same. It's objects. It's objects. Sorry, I got a little excited there. It's objects. Not to my knowledge, but uh, I think that's a uh, opportunity there, perhaps. Okay. Okay, so um, so what have we learned? I, like I said, I gave this talk at Big Ruby, and I kind of wanted to impress the crowd that Ruby is not just a one-trick horse that does does Rails only. There's other things you can do with Ruby, and exciting things that you can do with Ruby. We've got a reasonable multi-threaded solution, which really excites me because I think multi-thread is going to be the future, and it's not as good as closures, but it is doggone good and certainly workable and solves 90% of the problem that we've been dealing with. So I think that's, that's good news there. Uh, flying robots are fun. I almost brought my flying robot with me tonight, but uh, I didn't test it before I came. And I it was, uh, didn't feel like having untested code on my drone flying around the room would be a good idea. But you know what, guys? If you want to come over to our office sometime over lunch, and we'll just fly drones and... and uh, uh, we're still thinking about having a drone hacking day sometime in September if we can get sponsors to buy drones. 
hint, hint, hint. If you are interested, contact me or Karen Meyer about that. If your company, hmm? How much do they? They are three hundred dollars, and uh, and and that's ready to fly. You need to add a smartphone to it to actually control it. We'll be using at the hacking event. We'll be using laptops to do it. Generally, the rule is that if a sponsor buys a drone after the event, the sponsor takes the drone home. Hmm. <laughs> what remains of the drone after the hack day. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll need some drones. We'll probably also need a couple spare parts, spare propellers and cross blades and things like that. But Or, or an extra drone to cannibalize <laughs> for those parts. I think there's somebody who would be interested in sponsoring such an event. Yeah. So, yeah, so if, you know, I don't think we have to do a real big one. I'm not sure what kind of interest we'd have, but if you get two to three... So you have two to, two to three people on a drone, so to support 30 people, you could have 10 drones, and that would actually be a really, really nice, nice event. One of our clients bought a drone for the, the, actually their CEO bought the drone and handed it to him and said, here, use this to take photos at conventions. And they would, they would set up their big booth spread, right? And then they'd fly the drone up above and take aerial shots of their booth of all their stuff that was set up there. <laughs> so, I want to do mention the R2 library that uh, was written by Ron Evans out in California, Los Angeles. And R2 is a robot consolidation library. It talks to multiple robots at the same time, including drones, but also including things run by an Arduino or the Sphero robot. If you're, They're like little balls about the size of a baseball that change colors and roll around under, talk to it over Bluetooth and under program control. Really cool stuff. Um, yeah, and it's based upon celluloid and celluloid I.O. as well. Um, here's an example, R2 library. You tell it what your drivers are. You tell it, you know, things like this. So it's got a nice DSLE type uh, interface to it. Um, Ron Evans is the guy who works on Kids Ruby, and so they're using this kind of stuff for kids to. I Oh, ouch. Here's, here's Ron running one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think seven is the maximum number of devices you can have on Bluetooth. Uh, seven Spheros devices, all from one laptop under one program. Um, yeah, so one R2 based control program talks to the drone, talks, talks to a Wii controller, updates the drone a bazillion times a second. And let me show you them actually flying a drone with this library. Let's see, L.A. Drone Movie. So this, this took place at the uh, Marconi Automobile Museum. So there are multi-million dollar cars all around us here. He is flying the drone using a game controller connected to an Arduino, talking to the R2 library. The R2 library, R2... The R2 library is talking to the drone and, and controlling it. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, he's actually getting a video feed off of it. I'm going to skip to the end here. There's a really exciting part where it kind of gets close to a car and someone dashes out to protect the car. <laughs> Yeah, here he goes. He's getting nervous. He's getting nervous. He says, I'm going to go over here and stand right here. <laughs> he's bringing it into land. He's using, he's using the game controller there. It's going through the R2 library. And up, up, just back. Uh, uh, almost, almost. And, and uh, oh, oh, there we go. We're landed. No cars damaged. 
So that was, that was fun. And, and actually, the R2 library uses the Argus library that I'm working on to control my drone. So R2 uses Argus. Argus is what I'm writing to control my drone directly. So that's kind of all the connection there. Questions? Yes, your questions, kind of as we went. Where are you going to fly your drones on your drone hack deck? We don't have a venue yet. We're still kind of looking for a nice venue. A school gymnasium would be awesome. If anybody has any inroads to there, um, a large open room would also work well. We have a very large conference room with like 15 foot ceiling. Ah. It needs Wi Fi, right? Uh, the drones are actually their own Wi Fi hotspot, so you don't need it for the drones, but you will need something. Uh, people will want to be pulling stuff off the net and, and Googling and things, so you'll need some kind of network connection for that. So, yeah, a large area, a place we can set up some tables uh, for people to work at and, uh, you know, size to however, you know, we'll, however big we get, we'll size the event to that. So that's happening in September. Uh, give me your email or something and uh, may, we might come out and look at your conference room. <laughs> Another advantage of celluloid that's probably worth mentioning is it manages, like, Threads crashing and things yes. like that. Yes, and I haven't I haven't even looked into that kind of stuff very much, but yes. Yeah, yeah. So so, I looked at this, and this is a sponsor site for Cincinnati RB. I said, oh, we're still edge case there, but look at this. It's still gas like software. <laughs> so so. So yeah, we we were talking about that. Uh, let's see here. Um, are you guys ready for some hacking? Okay. So what I have done, I have a gist set up here, and uh, we can increase this so you can see the number up here. Uh, if you go to this gist, it has a gem file that just celluloid and celluloid I/O, and then a drone RB template that is the code using celluloid I.O. that connects up to my drone manager. So what I want you guys to do is grab this code, get it running on your laptop, and connect up to my drone manager. After you do that, uh, I, I want to point out that I added a new command, a new frown command just for tonight. It's called radar. It gives the coordinates of all the drones currently on the screen. So you can do something interesting like flee them, or attack them, purposely crash into them, or dance around them. I don't care. Uh, have fun writing interesting drone behaviors, and I will let my drone manager run, and we can watch everybody's drones uh, flying around on the screen. Is your code uh, for all that stuff up on GitHub? The yes. It is? Yes. Okay. It's in... Um, I can, I'll scour your it's, stuff. It's, it's in a presentation. Uh, okay. um, so this presentation and the source code for it are all in, it's, it's called um, Events and Cells, I think is the name of the presentation.